Um, yes. Thanks for joining in. Uh, are you in the East Coast? I am. I'm in New York. I'm in Long Island. New okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's 10 o'clock here in, 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 in London and stuff. Nice but, to meet um, you. Yes. Nice to meet you. Therese, I appreciate it. Um, you know, we, um, I think one of the things we have, we've started to do with our show, I said we, but I've started to do my show is really um, as a fan of great music, R&B music, especially in the 90s, the, the journey um, mm. of our famous, our favorite acts, how they got into music, um, okay. how they started off, how they made it big, how they've dealt with the challenges. And then we always look forward. And so it's really to inspire people who are still trying to get into music, but also inspire those of us who are struggling through this COVID stuff, lose last jobs that even yeah. the, the most successful of us have gone through struggles and how did you manage to go through it and stuff. Um, oh, but I always start off with just getting background so where, where, where exactly because we have an international artist um, audience where, where exactly are you from I'm, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn New York wow mm-hmm. born and raised in Brooklyn New York I live about 10 minutes from Brooklyn now in Long Island and it's, it's a part of New York called Valley Stream okay yeah and uh, on the east coast of the United States yeah, no, yeah, I think a lot of us are very familiar with New York films yeah. and everything. <laughs> but <laughs> during those days, how did you, did you, were you always into music when you were growing up? Um, I, I was because my dad was a church musician. He played uh, the piano and organ in church. So I started playing the piano and organ in church as well. So by the time I, I guess around eight, eight, between eight and 10 years old, I started playing the piano at church and that, that became my job all the way up through high school. Like every Sunday I would play the piano. Um, on Tuesdays I would teach the choir songs. And wow. that's, kind of, that's how I got my start in music in a Baptist church. And, and I think, we, you know, uh, most of our, us who aren't American would not be surprised because it we've seen from lots of stories that a lot of R&B artists started to hone their skills from the church. It seems as if yeah. the church was a factory of musicians or something like that. Yeah, factory of musicians and you and you always had an audience. You know, ah, every yeah. Sunday you, you, was, you was in front of an audience. So it kind of gave you a little bit of courage of performing and, um, you know, just playing good music, you know. So but in those days you focused on, on, on playing. What about the singing part? Was um, at the beginning, I really wasn't into singing that much. I, I could teach parts and do the harmonies. Even at the beginning of intro, I was more of the producer than a singer. Just just like within between the first album and the second album, I kind of really started, you know, from working with Kenny Green, God bless his soul, I learned a lot about singing. He was like my, my vocal coach. And um, prior to that, I had wanted to be a producer and maybe, if luck had it, a rapper. I really wasn't okay. into singing. You know, I was just into doing the music. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah. So back back when you were in, in, in high school and, and playing, did, who, who were your influences musically? Um, of things, people that you used to listen to yeah. really? Mm-hmm. Uh, James Ingram. Okay, yes, I remember that one. James Ingram. It's real. Uh, yeah. DeBarge. Oh, L. is it the group or, or just L? Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the, the group. Love Me in a Special Way, like those songs right there. Yeah. Because they, they sound like gospel songs, but they were R&B songs. So yeah. they really, they caught my ear. Luther Vandross. Oh, Luther. Uh, let me see, who else? Um, so many, man. No addition, you know, <laughs> during that time. Not so much musically, but like the whole fat of it you know the whole movement was like yeah, phenomenal yeah. I was like man that gotta be so much fun you know yeah and then during that time did you, you, you did you did you have your hair hard set on being a full-time performer or was it just like stuff you did on Sundays and yeah it was stuff that I did on Sundays I actually I, w- I wanted to be a baseball player I had my heart set on playing baseball okay. and um I just knew all the way through high school that I just wanted to be a baseball player, like me and my friends. And um, it was one day during baseball practice, the army recruiters walked out of the school and they started yelling at me. They was like, what are you doing after high school? What are you doing after high school? And I was like, I don't know. So they came out onto the baseball field and started talking to me about 
join in the army. And I just, I just got sucked in. I went and I took the test. And as a senior in high school, I joined the army. <laughs> oh, did your dad say, okay, good luck, son? Or what was um, my, my parents were pretty much, you know, like I said, I, I was working pretty much since I was like 10 years old. You know, I, I had a job and I was pretty much supporting myself. I was living at home with them. Yeah. But they, they kind of trust my judgment. And um, we did have a conversation. My father was like, you don't want to go to college? I was like, because I have a sister that's right underneath me. So I was like, I've ever heard take the money and go to college because I know she'll apply herself. If I go to college, I'm just going for the, what I've seen, like chasing the girls and the parties. And, you know, that's definitely what I would have went to college for. So I say, yeah, I'm going to go into the military. So um, had I known then what I know now, then I probably would have played baseball because the funny thing is, right, my father, he never took me to baseball games. So most of the times I was watching baseball, it was on television. And yeah. by watching baseball on television, everybody looks like a giant. So I was like, I'm too small to be a uh, professional okay. baseball player. Even though I was good and I had the skills and everything, I was saying to myself, oh, I'm too small to play baseball. Then later on, I started meeting professional baseball players that were smaller than me, or like the average of them was like my, my size. Yeah, and yeah. so I kind of like faked myself out of that. But um, my, and my friends that I was playing with ever since we was little kids, they just stuck with it. They're like, yeah, we're going to get some money playing baseball. And they went and played professional baseball. Yep. Okay, so they all went into the NFL, um, 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 MLB. Yep, MLB. One went to the Brewers. Wow, one went to cool. the Seattle Mariners. He was roommates with Ken Griffey Jr., Oh, yeah. <laughs> and these were my friends, you know, so I've always felt like if I would have stuck with baseball, I would have had like equal success with baseball and music. But I'm glad I got into music. Yeah, I definitely have no regrets. It's been a phenomenal experience. Yeah. So you joined the army. Um, I would take it, you know, you have to you have to be 18 before they let you join in. Yeah, I joined in. I joined in March. And I went in August 30th. I was 18 when I went in. Okay. Yeah. And and so when what's well what I mean what year was this? This was a long time ago, 1984. Okay. <laughs> so I was thinking 84. So I'm thinking what 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 was going on in, in 84? Apart 84 from it was in, pretty calm. It wasn't really yeah, any so was, war. Yeah, there wasn't Iraq hadn't started anything like that or Afghanistan. So that's that's when I ended up getting out after that war. I stayed through that war. And that's when the intro kicked off right after, excuse me, right after that war. That's after the intro. Okay. So during, so during that time in, in the army, what would, did you put away your music and just focus on the army? Or what were you able to do? Oh, um, well, that's where I met the lead singer, Kenny Green. Yeah. So do you, do you both come out at the same time from the army? Do you both quit at the same time? Or do you go first and then he follows? Or what, what was the, how was, what was the problem? Um, Kenny left the military about six months before I did. Okay. And he left right before the war started. I got deployed. I had to go to um, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. When I came back, Kenny had left North Carolina and went back home. And I didn't have any contacts from him at all. I didn't know where to find him or nothing. It took me like about three or four months once I got back to get back in touch with him. Yeah. Okay. And, um, but when you got back, you, you went back to your folks' house in New York? Um, yes, I moved back okay. in with mom. Yep. And then when you got home, did you then start thinking, because I, I would all assume that New York had more music connections than anywhere else. Was it easy to, to start making connections? or? Well, while, while I was still in the Army, we came up to New York and we met Heavy D. Oh. God bless Heavy D. You know, we, we met Heavy D in a club and we sang for him. And he took our phone number and he called us while I was still back in North Carolina in the army to come up to New York to meet with DJ Eddie F. So we came up and we met with DJ Eddie F and that's when he offered us um, a recording contract. But by this time was Heavy not the president of Uptown or was he not vice president of Uptown? No, he, he, was, no, he wasn't the president at that time. He was, um, it was still Andre Harrell. Like okay. this was like 1991. 91, okay, so Andre. But then why didn't he take it to Uptown? Um, because they had Jodeci. Ah, yeah, they they had Jodeci at that time. Okay, so, so um, yeah. did, when you performed for for Eddie, um, did he did he have a did he did you did you guys already have the name of of the group? Yeah, we we came to Eddie's intro. 
because pr prior to meeting Eddie, um, there was a guy in New York, a Russian guy named Ed Goldsman. He had a house music label. So he brought us into his studio to record a house music song. And it was called Under Your Spell. It's still on the internet somewhere, intro Under Your Spell. And he put it out. We, you know, we just signed the paperwork. We didn't know what we were signing or whatever. Oh. We just let him put it out. And um, he wouldn't let us do R&B music because he wanted to do just house music, house music, house music. I finally convinced him to let us do two R&B records. So I produced two R&B records with him. And that's when we met Eddie F. Like during that time while we were still signed with, with Ed Goldsman, we met Heavy D who introduced us to Eddie F. And I didn't tell Eddie F that we already had a contract with this guy, Ed Goldsman. So I went to Ed Goldsman and we pretty much, we didn't explain to him that we were going to sign with another label. We pretty much told him that we were breaking up. We didn't want to work together anymore. He was like, oh, this is so unfortunate. And he signed us out of the deal. He released us from his label. And then that's when we were able to go on and do rhythm and blues music with um, Heavy D and um, Eddie F. Now, at that point, so you, could you mention the, a very crucial thing that a lot of my guests keep saying is about the business side of the music side. So there's a talent and then there's the business side oh yeah signed with ed did you so you he could have had taken everything that you've written and own it and you wouldn't have known well, yeah Th those three songs that we have that we did with him the house music record and yeah. the two rhythm and blues songs he has them on itunes now and he makes every penny from them we don't make a single penny that was the agreement that we made with him but we didn't know you know at this point we're, we're in the army we, you know, just doing it pretty much for the fun of it. Yeah. But. And, and as then, did, did you then, had, what did you then, when you, when Eddie F presents you with a contract, do you then, are you obliged to get legal advice? Uh, and not just because of Eddie F, but any type of contract, or you just sign right there? Oh, no, you have to give it to an attorney. They, their attorney sends it, their attorney sent it to our attorney. And um, how do we find our attorney? Yeah. Through them. Because we didn't know anything. So we <laughs> pretty much let them pick the attorney. So he's sending it to his friend and yeah. they just work out whatever it takes to make the deal happen, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I interviewed um, Tabitha Duncan from, from Cut Close and she said that yeah, but, yeah. You, you, you get, uh, they give you, you get an attorney and they all know each other. They all, they all know uh, each other. They yeah. all know each other. I, sp I sp interviewed Dawn Robinson from the Vogue and she said, I know an, a, an attorney that you might get might say, well, if I try and side my client against the record label, I'm not going to, I've got other clients there that they may say, well, we're not going to work with you again. So they're not, as much as they'll try and do fair advice, they're not going to be always in your corner. Yeah, because the groups come and go. You know, the label is there. They need that business from the label. So yeah, yeah. but but did you sign a, a deal that was for for the, for the time? Was it a fair deal or was it really bad? Or what, what was your um, when you re reflection? It was it was a standard R and B deal during that time. I think every R and B artist that I speak to that came through that through that era, like the nineties, like 92, 93, 94, it was pretty much the, the same contract. The only difference would be the the advance up front, like what money, how much money they would advance you up front, which is nothing more than a loan because you have to pay that back before yeah. you start seeing your royalty money. So with certain artists, they would get like maybe fifty thousand dollars, and then you have another artist that may only get five thousand dollars. Yeah, and. Uh, that was just up to the label and how much they believed in the project and how much, you know, they were going to put behind it. So it's like a corporation and they, you know, they're going to be here forever pretty much. So yeah. they have a reputation to uphold. So they're not going to do but so much, you know, to you, you know? Yeah. So you have 40 songs and they are sending it to the vote vault. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of us are learning about what they call masters. And does that mean that those 40 songs don't belong to you anymore? Right. They, the label owns those songs. They have the right to do whatever they want with those songs. And when you're sending them 40 songs, did you know that that's the case, that we're sending them the songs and they own it and it's like I've just painted, I've done a pie and it mm -hmm. goes back to the field? Did you have an idea? Or what was your... Well, 
they they were paying for it, you know. There's paying right by right. There's paying the studio time, you know. They were paying us, and you know that was our job to turn over songs at that time. So okay. they have them there, and we can still release them if we want to and collect our publishing money. Like that's what's going to happen with the album in June. They're going to pull songs from the vault and remaster them and okay. put those out. Yeah. Okay. So, but yeah. So, on reflection, though, would you have thought, okay? we've got these songs, we can keep some of them and just turn over 15 songs mm -hmm. and we still keep the other 25. On reflection, knowing what you know now about the business, would you have done stuff like mm -hmm. that or would you sort of given them the 40? Right, well, they have, they have about 40 songs in the vault and then there's another 40 or 50 songs just laying around producers' homes. Like I, I've been, I was on the phone with a producer the other day, he has three songs that he's gonna submit for the movie soundtrack. You know, that's never been released. We never gave to the record company or anything. So, you know, there's still a lot of intro stuff. I go on the internet and come across unreleased music all the time from us. I don't know how it gets out there, but um, yeah. it's almost there's, a whole album out there of unreleased songs right now. Yeah, there's a friend of mine, um, um, Richard from The Grapevine. Um, he, he, mm -hmm. He's on IG. And he, he told me about two songs, Put, Put Me On. Yeah, put me on. A lot of people ask about put me on. Um, they want, they ask me, do I have it and can I send it to them? And I don't even have that record. Like um, that's uh, Jonathan Morant and Eddie F. They, they have that record, put me on in its entirety. And um, he may release it. Eddie might release it one day. Okay. I'm sure wish she would. <laughs> uh, um, but then who, does he own it or who owns it? Um. That song right there, is, it's just like a rogue song. We just recorded it. Nobody really owns it because we don't have a deal for that record. Like if Eddie was to put it out, then that would have to be a whole different um, agreement. Like, you know, on the points and how much, what, what are the splits on it? It's like coming over to a friend house and just recording a song. Okay. Um, that's okay. what happened pretty much. We were just there and the music is on and just, hey, let's do it. And um, that happened a lot. We got, we have a lot of songs out there. Very similar to what Prince would do, just record lots of music and stuff, but he he he'd keep hold of his stuff. What about those and how can yep. you how can you? How can yeah, how can you let me down? Yeah. It has a Jay-Z beat underneath it. Can't can't knock the hustle. Okay. Yeah, that's that's yeah. another one of them. Yeah. And and that's you don't know have that one, but that's out there. That's out there as well. I have that. I have that. I have, I just don't have put me on. I have I have how can, how can, so, shoot, I might've been listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, as I said, oh yeah, here you go. Okay. You hear that? Yeah. on the keys? Um, no, that's on Rashad, Rashad Smith. And I'm thinking I missed the 90s um, because we don't, they, they don't, they, no one, no producers 
don't don't they're not non innovative like this and stuff. I mean that's that's <clears throat> listening to, to Kenny and I it reminds me of Diesel, um Daryl Diesel Adams from um nine one one. Yeah, basic black. The, 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 yeah, basic black mainly. But the, the there's there is there is such a I think like Luther has it. There is something powerful about how they sing that is very effortless. You can't teach that. Um, you can't. Come you can from, hear. from in here. Yeah, I'm listening to that. I'm saying, wow, that's that's such a the, the I could hear pain and and joy and truth in in, in just this that short small clip. We have, we have songs that. I mean, if somebody, if there was a label to put an album together, like right now, like it's coming in June, but um, I, I mean, I think we missed a lot of years of not putting out good music and stuff. Of songs that I did with him, I might have like five that me and him did together, but songs that he's done with other producers that we, you know, started working on for the albums and stuff, it's probably about 40, 50 unreleased intro songs. But that you, that you have in your possession? Nah, I'm, in my possession, I have maybe 20. Okay. Maybe 20, like the ones that I played today. Yeah. I see another, I see another gym with you that um, a lot, of, like a lot of people don't know. Even Jeff didn't know like three, three, four years. Like I, I have a job, right? I got a day job. I'm a New York City police officer. I work for NYPD, but I, I'm retiring in July. What? So now, I will, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I retired July 1st of this year. And um, I did the whole, I did the whole 17 years. I didn't have to do 20 years because of the military. So I could retire at 17. So for the past 17 years, I actually been a New York City cop and pretty much nobody knew about it in the industry. I can say it now because I'm getting ready to retire and I'm not really out on the street like that anymore. But um, yeah, man. You gotta, well, was that was that because you had to or why did you do that? I, I, I had to, I had to. That was in 2004. That was three years after Kenny died. Yeah. And um, the emergence of hip hop, not one phone call to come out and do shows. Um, I wasn't hearing the songs on the radio anymore. I figured that was the end of um, professional music. I still had my home studio, and, you know, like people would come in and I would um, do projects with them. But as far as having a real job and feeding my family, I, I had to get a job. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel but most importantly to press the notification bell so that you can be notified when we do have a new interview, loads to come. But thanks a lot for watching.